Welcome to a priori story time list. Today we'll be reading from a book by Robert Wolf, Original Wisdom, it's called, with the subhead, Stories of an Ancient Way of Knowing. <coughs> We've opened to a chapter called Bali and the Barong. Yeah, you're very prepared to be a little scared for this. What is life? Someone asked me not long ago. I answered, jumping from ice flow to ice flow in a raging torrent. Or think of life as a sort of balancing act in an ever-changing environment. If we are fast and agile, we can stay upright by jumping to another ice flow, just as the one we are standing on is tipping or sliding out from under us. Sometimes we fall into the icy water and we must scramble up another ice flow and go on. And all the while, the river is moving who knows where. The image of the rushing ice flows I thought of myself. But the idea I borrowed for the Balinese, whose worldview is that nothing in the world, nothing in the universe, is stable. One can never know what is going to happen next. <clears throat> okay, Swathi and Snakey, you ready? You ready, Zaki? Okay. In every village in Bali, which is an island in Indonesia, twice a month at the full moon and the new moon, an event takes place that Westerners call a dance. <clears throat> the villagers gather in the village square just before dark. Kids, dogs, and chickens wander here and there. At one end of the village square are two upright stone structures, often elaborately carved, that frame an entrance. Suddenly, a horrible cry is heard, and through this entrance, a frightening apparition appears, a screeching old witch in a terrifying mask, breasts made of horizontally striped cotton, bold black alternating with white, hanging to her knees and a tongue that seems to be on fire, hanging between her breasts. She is a Rangda, and that means widow. The chief Layak, a witch, but identified with all kinds of misfortune. They think perhaps she's related to Kali in Hindu mythology. <coughs> Sometimes she has one or two helpers adding to the turmoil. In larger villages, these helpers and their screams precede her. The villagers become quieter, but they have seen this often enough. Rangda, who visits twice a month, is a familiar appearance. <clears throat> she strides around the square, threatening, cursing, screaming. She taunts the villagers. Is there no one then in this blasted village who will defend his home from me? First one, then more young men, and some not so young, come into the square. They draw their crease, daggers with extremely sharp wavy blades against Rangda. They will defend the village. They are quite serious about warding off this screaming apparition and the disasters she foreshadows. Now Rangda stands tall, probably on the steps of the gate, facing the men, pointing all her fingers. They're gloved with five inch long nails that curve down. <clears throat> she points all of her fingers at them. And it is easy to believe that a force pushes the men back. This almost palpable force ebbs and flows, now allowing the men to come closer to Rangda, then almost literally throwing them back. The villagers seem intensely alive now, observing a battle that is playing out in front of their eyes. This is real. It is no dance. Although it looks choreographed, the force that controls the men is real enough. The villagers watch spellbound. The story may have become routine, but the outcome is always in doubt. In all of the times that I've seen the Baron, as this event is called, it continues like this. Rangda becomes stronger. 
so strong, in fact, that she is able to turn the men's daggers against themselves. They are forced to turn their wrists so that the crease is now aimed at their own chests. One can see the point of the crease press, but rarely puncture the skin. Yet these daggers are very sharp. The men visibly struggle to use all their strength to prevent themselves from being hurt by the crease. They are under great stress, muscles quivering. Sweat is pouring down their faces and bodies. Some say that Rhonda puts the men into a trance, which turns their daggers against them, though others say that the only way to survive while resisting Rhonda is to put yourself in a trance. The men are obviously in a deep trance, not the relaxed kind we've learned about in the West. <clears throat> in this trance, each of them staggers, bent far backward, holding back the crease that seems to want to pierce the chest of its owner. This is hard work. Later, when it is over, the men are spent. It takes at least a day to recover, I was told. This goes on for varying lengths of time until when the men seem at the end of their endurance, the spirit protector of the village enters. Baron, a wonderful monster, a mythical beast with a huge carved head. Baron is big. It takes two men to carry the sacred image. The one in front is inside the enormous head, swaying from side to side. The man behind is inside the rest of the elaborate cloth beast. Baron is a protector. He moves around reviving men who have fallen. Sometimes when Rangda is particularly strong, almost all men fall in a faint. Priests and others offer sips of holy water to those struggling to come out of their trance. Barong does not fight, but he prevents the men from being hurt when they are about to pierce their own chests. He strengthens the men's ability to resist Rangda. As the men regain some strength, and as Rangda loses hers, the battle changes. The few men who can find still more energy chase the witch back through the gate, and the village is safe for another two weeks. This event takes many hours, sometimes the whole night. It is certainly not entertainment, a trance dance as some guidebooks call it, but a ceremony, it is all too real. There are times when Rhonda wins, when the men cannot prevent her from walking into the village. If that happens, earthquakes shake the ground, volcanoes erupt, epidemics descend and many other terrible things occur. The important fact to remember is that no one ever knows the outcome. A dance is a stylized story and we often know how it ends, but the ending of a baron cannot be predicted. Having watched this dance several times, I believe that. It is obviously a battle fought on another plane. It is almost visibly a battle of spirit, good and evil. But that is a Western simplification. The Baron ceremony is not about these two opposing spirits. Rhonda is the spiritual force of destruction. Baron is protection. And the people are the spirit of survival, of growth, of life. Twice a month, twice a month, these forces are testing each other's strengths and weaknesses. It is not so much a dance as it is a ritual, as, a, as it is a trial. Mm -hmm. The Barong says something about the Balinese idea of what life is about. Mm -hmm. To the Balinese, the universe, the cosmos, both the physical and the spiritual cosmos, which to the Balinese are mirror images, is not neat and orderly. They do not understand the Western idea that says the universe is lawful, that if we know the laws, the cycles, the regularities, 
then we can predict the future. The Balinese say that the cosmos is unknowable, unpredictable, changing according to no rule or law of man or even of God's. That means we must live always and only in the here and now. That is all there is. And we must be prepared at all times to move with the changes that are, that are inevitably happening to our world and to us.